It's nice to be in the presence of people who know that God is good. And that when no matter what challenges life brings, no matter what mistakes that we make, what intentional infractions we commit, or what people say to us, or about us behind our backs, that our calling to relationship with Christ and to shine the light of Christ to the world is worth fighting for. Good morning again, First Central. I'm excited to be here this morning. A little sleepy. <laughs> I will uh, unofficially, on behalf of uh, Sister Amara uh, and myself, it will be official when she comes and we can do it together. Um, we would like to thank everyone in the congregation uh, for their prayers, for cards, for well wishes, um, because uh, little Daryl is amazing. His friend. His friend. He's probably crying right now. <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge our pastor in his absence, uh, the deacons of this church, the ministry circle, all of the leaders in this church, uh, our family from Trinity, love you so much. Um, the One Way Youth Ministry, always, right? In, in every form, fashion, if you were ever connected to the ministry, even way back when it was called GYO, right? The youth ministry of First Central Baptist Church um, has changed some lives. It wasn't that far back though. The, the education ministries love you guys also. Uh, the dance ministry and the music ministry. So this is what, what's gonna happen. I'm going to read a tiny piece of scripture. Then I'm going to try to preach. I'm going to give you some points that hopefully you'll be able to apply to your life. And then I'm going to take my seat. Right? That, that's the order that we're going, to, we're going to go in. And we'll squeeze a prayer in there somewhere. Uh, the scripture reading today was found or it will be found in the second chapter of Mark, beginning at the first verse. Deacon Gale read it so well that I'm actually only going to read one verse. Now you can stand up for one verse if you're able. Uh, if you're slow by the time you finish standing up, <laughs> I'll be finished. The fifth verse says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Sons, your sins are forgiven. When Jesus saw their faith, uh, for the next couple of moments, we'll reflect on the thought, faith that Jesus sees. Faith that Jesus sees. Let us pray. Eternal and all wise Father, gracious and merciful God, it is once again, O oh Lord, that we come to you in the house of worship to worship. God, right now, we ask that you just allow the Holy Spirit to continue to move in this place. Allow Daryl David Moore to decrease. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Hide me behind the blood of the cross so that ministry can continue to take place, O Lord. Lord, we ask that you bind anything that might be distracting of you, O Lord, that you just allow your people to walk away with collectively and individually what you have for them on this morning. God, even as they stand here, we're just thankful and, and excited about uh, bonds that are being broken, O God, about breakthroughs that are on the horizon, about healing that is taking place in the body and in relationships. God, we ask that you have your way in this house. Why? Because it is your house. Yeah. Use me, O oh Lord, so that the seed may be planted, 
that a soul may be saved, that the church may be edified, and most of all, Father, that you will be glorified. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. A faith that Jesus sees, faith that Jesus sees. As many of you know, I uh, listen to hip hop. And uh, as somebody who uh, was born in around the same time that the art form was uh, being developed in the Bronx, I am familiar with uh, many lyrics that deal with sight. Uh, one rapper said, you couldn't see me if you were looking through my eyes. Uh, another rapper said, you couldn't see me if you were glancing in the mirror. Another rapper says that they try to see me and they're mad because they can't be me. There, there, there is a constant thread through hip hop that talks about viewing somebody as an equal. Yeah. Not only as viewing somebody as an equal, but viewing uh, somebody as a superior or having a, how should I say, a honest reflection of one's capabilities. I think that sometimes we as Christians feel as if nobody sees us. Similar to Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. That the blackness that we have, the, the fact that we have been kissed by the rays of the sun, that, that that our skin cells are, are melanated, that, that sometimes where we go, people don't see who we are. Sometimes, Brother Jonathan, people disrespect us because of our faith. They feel as if they can treat us any kind of way, speak to us out of pocket and as if they're out of their mind, and we should have to deal with it because we are Christians. Other times we, we try to love on people. We give them everything that we feel as if we have so that they can see that we're connected to God. And it seems as if they're not appreciative at all. We feel as if nobody sees our faith. If for some reason you feel as if or you felt as if somebody couldn't see your faith, I, I believe that this text gives us a few ideas of, of how we can practice our faith in a way that the most important person who needs to see it will see it, and that's Jesus. You know the story. The, the, the story says that there, there is a small fishing village called Capernaum on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. It is in this village that we find Jesus in a house, perhaps owned by Peter, preaching and teaching the word. Such excitement was conjured up because of a rumor that spread that, that Jesus was around, that the crowd of listeners grew and grew. People were packed inside, perhaps some of them sitting, maybe some leaning on each other, somebody leaning on the wall. It was very crowded. People were, were inside of this house, shoulder to shoulder, listening to the master teacher. They were so crammed in there that, that there wasn't any room. And, and the scripture says that, that there was no room outside the door and at the door, that there were people all around this small little house. But they didn't leave because they were interested in hearing what Jesus had to say. What was the specific message, you may wonder? Truthfully, I'm not sure. However, what I am sure is that it was connected to the central message that Jesus preached as we see this message in varied iterations throughout the scripture. Jesus is always preaching about the kingdom of God. You know, it's a message of love and justice. It's a message of compassion and mercy. 
It's a message of forgiveness and reconciliation. It's a message of encouragement and correction. It's a message that challenges the status quo and preaches to the very core of those who are on the margins of society. It's a message of opportunity for the poor, freedom for the prisoners, sight for the blind, food for the hungry, clothes for the naked, and liberation for the oppressed. It's the message of healing. It is the message of the gospel. Jesus lived this message and took it everywhere he went, including to this particular house in the village of Capernaum. He was in the house preaching this message, and, and, and there was no security to say, hey, we're shutting it down because it's too crowded. The, the, the fire department didn't show up and, and tell the people that they have reached the maximum permitted occupancy and, and tell some people that they needed to go home. So Jesus kept teaching and the crowd kept growing. The scripture says that eventually five men walked up to listen to Jesus. Actually, the truth is only four of them walked because one of them was paralyzed. They carried him in, in a, mat, a, a makeshift kind of stretcher because he couldn't use one or more of his limbs. And, 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 and they stood trying to get into the house. They couldn't get in the door because there was no room for anybody else. They couldn't squeeze by the window because they, they, couldn't, they couldn't squeeze the man in the stretcher through the window. They, they went around the back, and, and around the back, it, it was also crowded. There was no way for them to get inside of this house. So they made a plan. These men, because they were from the area, knew that, that houses in, in Galilee had a particular kind of architectural design. These, these houses had roofs of, of that were usually made of wood cross beams, perhaps of, of logs or thick branches covered by th uh, thatches of palm leaves or reeds or thorn bushes that were sealed with mud. Almost all of the houses had them. The roofs were used for storage and sometimes for drying food, fruit. These roofs were rather sturdy. They, they, they were used for work and even slept on in warm weather because people didn't have air conditioner back then. And, and since an external staircase or, or sometimes a ladder led to these roofs so that people could gain access to them, uh, uh, between the four of them, they came up with an idea. They came up with an idea that they would take the man, and, and so they took the man with the mat and they carried him up to the roof. Now, I, I, I don't know why they came up with this idea because uh, I, I know that I'm small and, 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 and I, I know that sometimes in New York we don't have like the largest stairwells, but sometimes even moving a mattress or a piece of furniture upstairs is very challenging. And so they brought this man to the roof. Perhaps they just wanted to listen to Jesus a little bit more. But while they were on the roof, they, 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 they came up with this crazy idea that they would reach on top of the roof and, and start scraping away the mud and, and that they would keep on scraping and, and, and keep on moving and, and dismantling this roof, although it wasn't their house, so that they could get closer to Jesus. Imagine the, the, the confusion on, on the disciples' face as they were listening to Jesus and ceiling started leaking dirt. Can, 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 can you imagine the expression of a, a surprise of everybody in, in the house when, when, when an extra light came through the ceiling and, and this man was, was dropped down in front of Jesus on this stretcher? Jesus looks at the man. He looks up at his friends. And then he looks back at the man. And he looks up at his friends. And he says, because of their faith to the man, your sins have been forgiven. Amen. My question for you today is, does Jesus see your faith? Yes. Come on. You may have a counter question to me. Your question may be, Reverend Moore, Daryl, D, whatever you choose to call me, why does it matter if I have faith that Jesus sees and 
What is faith that Jesus sees? I think we'll deal first with the former. It matters that you have faith that Jesus sees because like this man, I believe that everybody at one time or another in their life feels paralyzed. What does it mean to, 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 to be paralyzed? It means to, to be brought to a condition of, of helpless stoppage or inactivity. It's being in the state of an ability to think, to act, to move in a positive or a desired direction. Some of us can wave our arms. We can move our legs. We can nod our heads. We've made it to First Central this morning, but we're paralyzed. Some of us duck phone calls from 888 numbers, 800 numbers, 210 numbers, or every number that is not saved in our cell phone because people are trying to collect money from us that we don't have and we feel as if we answer the phone. We won't be able to live our life and so we walk around with the stress on our back not taking care of our finances. We're paralyzed. Some of us have had people do some very wicked things to us sexually as children or even as adults. And we come to church and, and we want to have a healing, we want to deal with it, but we're so embarrassed and don't even know how to talk about it, especially when everybody is giving praise and lifting their hands up. So we come and we fake it, although we're not really experiencing the worship of God. We're paralyzed. Some of us just want our fathers to acknowledge us. Come on now. We want them to realize that our eyebrows look like theirs. That there's a bass in our voice that's similar to them. And so we have fractured relationships with males and we treat women in ways that they shouldn't be treated. Whereas we're trying to put ourselves together, we can't because we are paralyzed. I'm not sure if any of these things have arrested you. If they have, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to throw out some real examples. Yeah. If this one didn't touch or walk down your street, yeah. that's okay. I don't need to know what you're dealing with. But, but, but I feel as if we all need to realize that there is something that can get us beyond being paralyzed believers. We don't need to be paralyzed parishioners who enter First Central every week and then leave and then come back every week that leave and then come back and we're still in our paralyzed state. That we have faith that Jesus sees and we can change in our lives. Look at the scripture, look at the scripture. The story says that that these men came with their paralyzed friend. The, the, the man couldn't make it on his own. And then when they got to the front door, they couldn't get in the front door because the door was too crowded. There was too much of an opposition. There was a blockage in front of Jesus who was the blessing, who was the blessor, who was the person that could change their lives. They could get close to Jesus, but they couldn't get close enough to Jesus in order for Jesus to move in a way that they needed to move. But it's interesting because this whole house was filled with people who wanted to hear Jesus. If you want to hear a word from the Lord, I suggest that you have some kind of faith. But these men had different faith than those people that were in the room listening to Jesus. Don't look to your left, don't, don't look to your right, and make sure that you keep your eyes looking at me, but, but I hate to break it to you, but there's somebody in this church on your pew whose faith is not the same kind of faith that you have. There's somebody who may even judge you and the way that you behave, and they, they want to tell you that your skirt is too short, that you shouldn't wear jeans, that you should pull up your jeans, that your hair is too nappy, that you can't recite enough scriptures. But their faith is not being seen by 
Jesus. The first thing that we can do to have faith that Jesus sees is that we need to have creative faith. A faith that Jesus sees is a faith that's creative. Now, I'm not going to talk about any of the preachers that preach here at First Central because I love the preachers that preach here at First Central. And I'm not going to talk about anybody's ministry in a bad way, so if you take this, please don't distort my words, but somewhere in somebody's Baptist church, somewhere, there are people that preach that every time that Jesus moves in your life, Jay, that it's going to be easy. They feel as if they should be able to just walk up to the door and have immediate access to Jesus, the movement of God, and their breakthrough. But the scripture says, as I just spoke, that there was interference, that there was obstruction, that there was resistance, that there was struggles, that there was trust. They couldn't get in this house, and so what did they do? They had to be creative with this thing. So let me tell you, when I say that a uh, faith that Jesus sees is a faith that's creative, let me tell you that if you activate your faith, that any time that the front door is closed, a creative faith will say that I can get through the side and Jesus will give me what I need. Come on, come on. Come on, come on. So they stood there and they walked up. They walked up onto that roof and they started to exercise a creative faith. They started to exercise a, a, a faith that, 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 that moved in a way that people were not accustomed to seeing. And it wasn't the first time in Scripture that we see it. We see that God wanted to free some slaves down in Egypt. He took a stuttering murderer named Moses. And he told him to go to the king. Go to Pharaoh and ask for the people to be let go. Yeah. After uh, not wanting to do it, when he finally put his heart to it, Moses finally led the people out. What happened? He ended up being between a large body of water and an army that was trying to kill him. But God, yes, God. in his creativity, separated the water so that his people could walk through and be delivered. Joshua had a similar situation in the entrance of the promised land. He gets to the shore of the Jordan and, and how do you get in? But, but God in his creativity, he moves the, 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 the water so that they could walk through. Joshua had a similar situation when, when they get to Jericho, they walked around the wall seven times and one wall fell down so they can get in. God gives us creative faith because our creativity is a catalyst to God's creative move in our life. The second, the second point is that faith that God sees is a faith that's communal. The scripture says that there was a a man who was paralyzed, carried by four men. Most of the time, preacher people say that, that, that there are, are four men carrying a friend. I've read multiple translations. I, I went back to the Greek text, and, and, and I love the fact that although they may have been connected to each other, the word in the original language is not necessarily friend, right? Because what's not important was the fact that they liked each other, but what was important was that there were some people that had faith that realized that some people, person that was uh, lacking, needed some help, and so they decided to help them in community. Listen, I know that it's hard. I know that sometimes you can't even feed yourself. But on occasion, if you have faith, in this God we serve, every once in a while, you need to give to somebody who does not live in your house, in your area code, in your zip code. You need to stretch and do something for the community. How can that look? 
It can look like giving the sister a ride on a rainy day. It can look like giving somebody some change when they're asking for it on the subway and not caring whether or not they're going to buy food or buy some dope. It, 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 it can look like uh, looking at somebody's child that, that might be disrespecting their parent and realizing that sometimes you can tell a, a child something that they won't hear from their parent, but they'll hear it from you and that you can parent together for somebody. Amen. What does it look like in community? It can look like instead of disrespecting our young people based on the fact that we've been doing ministry for so much longer that they had that we can let them in so that they can do some work and that if they fail we give them the room to do it and catch them because somebody did the same for us. What does it look like? Community. 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 Faith that Jesus sees is not only about Daryl David Moore. Faith that Jesus sees is not only about Liz Moore. Faith that Jesus sees is not only about Soika Penado. Faith that Jesus sees is about us as a unit. I'm not making it up. I understand that, that, that we have a personal savior, but from the beginning to the end, from the alpha Chi Omega. The scripture says that Jesus, God wanted to make a people. He said, you will be my people and I will be your God. We are in community the same way that God is in community. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are made in his likeness and his image. We are made to relate to each other, to deal with each other, to connect to each other. We need to have faith that is communal because it's faith that Jesus sees. The third thing, faith that Jesus sees is faith that's clear. We sometimes run through this story really quick. Oh, we're going to raise the roof. They ripped the roof off. Oh, oh, they got in there and Jesus rid the sins. Jesus healed the man. But we failed to think that this was very weird. And, and that there were some people that were outside of this house that also couldn't get inside this house that saw these people walking up onto the roof. We failed to realize that, that when they dropped this man in the midst of this crowded room that, that there were people who were actually watching this going on. See, when, when I say that, 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 that faith that Jesus sees is a faith that's clear, I'm saying that our faith needs to be visible. It's not good enough to walk around to pay our tithes, and you should keep paying your tithes. It's not good enough to come here to pay your offering, and you should keep paying your offering. It's not good enough to come here and serve on a ministry, and when you walk out of the doors of First Central, nobody knows that you're connected to Jesus who died on the cross because you're hiding it. Your faith needs to be clear. What does a clear, visible faith look like? For those of us who are on the beginning of our journey, it may look like telling somebody, excuse me, at a meal, and publicly praying before you eat. For, for those of us who, who, who have been on this a little bit longer, it might look like uh, uh, letting people know that Although our situation is hard, that we understand that, that God has it, so we're not going to fall apart. Amen. For some of us who are in a particularly dark place, it might have looked like having the courage enough to fall apart, to mourn what's going on in your life, but then acknowledging the fact that Jesus can, will, and still yes. is God on the throne. Everything that we do should be connected to Jesus and who Jesus is. Now, I know that y'all never did it, but there was a time in my life that I was ashamed of this Jesus thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was ashamed. You've heard the story before. It's a friend of mine that used to go to this church when I was a teenager. There was a whole lot of us. We went to Port Richmond High School. We would come here to choir rehearsals, sometimes go to the Life Center to play basketball. We'd go to Bible study. We'd go to, to the youth group. And, and we would see each other in the hallway. And we'd be like, yo, fam, yo, 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 you going tonight? Because we didn't want anybody to know that we were connected to a God that was worshipped inside of this building in this area of 
Staten Island. I hope that you are not hiding your faith. Because Jesus, the Jesus who was inside of this room, the Jesus who was preaching and teaching so much that people crowded around to hear him, Jesus said that we are to be the salt of the earth and if we're not salt, we'll, salty, we will lose our flavor. Jesus said that we are supposed to be the light of the world and he asked a question. He said, why or who takes a candle and puts it under a bed? Why would God give you the light if you're going to put it in a place that's so dark that nobody can see it? Faith that Jesus sees is faith that's clear. Faith that Jesus sees is, is creative, it's, it's communal, it's, it's clear, and, and, and not only that, not only that, but faith that Jesus sees is See, I, I messed my synonyms up and trying to go with the trying to go with the C's, right? The faith that Jesus sees is a faith that celebrates. It's a faith that celebrates. The scripture says that 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 they put this man down in front of Jesus. And and Jesus said to the man, because of their faith, your sins are forgiven. Two things happen every time that Jesus sees your faith. The first thing is that Ephesians says it is by faith through grace we are saved. By grace through faith we are saved. That means that inside of us there is a disconnection, there is a death. We are not connected to God because of our nature, because we're not thinking about God, because we don't care about God, because we are like doing ourselves, we made ourselves gods of our lives or people around us and so we're not connected and God will forgive our sins and change our lives. Here in the Baptist church we say that's the gift of salvation. But Jesus didn't come just so that we could have life. The scripture says that Jesus came so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. So Jesus looked at this man and he said, your sins are forgiven. And because in any situation where Jesus is around and where folk are around, there are some haters, okay? And these haters, they said, well, who is this Jesus God who said that he can forgive their sins? They don't even know what the man's sins are. He just came up in the room. How are you going to forgive something you don't even know what the person been through? And Jesus said, well, I have the power to do this. And since you have the mouth to talk, let me show you what being Jesus is about. And so Jesus gives not only the first thing, which is the gift of salvation, but he gives life-changing power to this man. The scripture says that, that, that he speaks to the man. He tells the man to take up your mat and walk, and the man started walking. When Jesus comes into your personal situation, Jesus doesn't save you on this side of, of, of heaven so that we can only have benefits on that side of heaven. But, but, but like the Lord's Prayer, like on earth as it is in heaven, already not yet. Jesus saves us so that we can live this thing now. He will move in your life a second way so that is very tangible. What does that mean? That means that broken relationships can be reconciled. That means that broken hearts can be repaired. That means that 500 credit scores can move towards 200. That means that drug addictions can be broken. That means that tears can be dried. That means that whatever you have been asking God to do, he has the power to do it right now. But he doesn't do it so that we can walk around and say, I'm better than you. Look at what God did for me. He does it so that we can celebrate. The scripture says that, 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 that after Jesus said that, that your sins are forgiven, and that after he told the man to look, that the people were amazed and they started to praise God. Yes. How did praising God look in this little tiny church? Excuse me, it was a house. I don't know how it looked in this little tiny house. I don't know. I assume that they didn't have a Hammond organ, but you don't need a Hammond organ to praise God. Yeah. I assume that they didn't have a drum set, but you don't need a drum set 
to praise God. I assume that since they were at a house and not at a church that they didn't have any deacons and they probably didn't have a preacher aside from Jesus, but you don't need deacons and, and a preacher to praise God. I, I assume that they didn't have ushers standing on the door or nurses that were passing out water, but as long as God moves in your life, you don't need any of them to praise God. All you need is faith that Jesus sees. Faith that's creative. Faith that's communal. Faith that's clear. A faith that celebrates. Yes. And when you have these things, yes. everywhere your feet walk, people will see that you are a little bit different Hallelujah. than you used to be. Hallelujah. Every time your mouth opens, yes. people will realize that you might look the same, but you're not the same. Yes. Every time that you go someplace, people will say, I don't know what's different about her. I don't know what's popping with him. But whatever's going on with them, I want a little bit of that. And if they ask you, you can tell them that you have faith in Jesus. And what's important is that it's faith that Jesus sees. God bless you. Listen, we need to stop playing games. Some of us know we're playing games. Some of us are in denial that we're playing games. Some of us have been taught to play the game. We're told that you act a particular way to be a believer. And that if you don't do it that particular way, then you're not a Christian. That faith looks like a suit and tie. That faith looks like listening to particular music. That, that faith looks like going to seminary, whatever, 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 whatever you're taught. What I'm trying to communicate, as I add to my sermon after I finish my sermon, preachers never do this. The personal things that God removes from your life oftentimes are for you. And when they're not only for you, and you're supposed to share that or bond with somebody that God removed those things, you know. Let's stop trying to put our faith around peg in square holes. Because Jesus is not about that. Perhaps you want to get connected with Jesus because he gave this gift of salvation. He died, suffered, he rose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We get so excited about the fact that he rose. But what's more important is that he's returning for us. All you have to do is confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart the same. Here at the First Central Church, we say the doors of the church are open. It's basically a saying if you've given your life to Christ for the first time, that you start playing faith and you start moving into a faith that Jesus sees. We're asking that you come and join our church so that we can help you mature. So that part of your story can help us mature that we can grow together in this thing. You can come as a candidate for baptism, meaning for the first time, you're giving your life to Jesus. You can come under Christian experience. Perhaps you've already given your life to Jesus, but you're just looking for a church home. We here for you at First Central. You can come under watch care. Perhaps you don't want to change church membership. You're just here for a while on work assignment, military assignment, or on, at school. We're here for you, if there be one. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, deacons.